Yeah. You want to like them, but you can't. Are you listening? What? Are you listening? Did you bring me on this show to insult me? Yeah. Uh. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh. Yeah. Hey, y'all don't want it with us, uh. man. We straight gangsters over here, Drake man. Gangsters. Uh. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, good morning. It is a beautiful Monday morning, and you are listening to Scout Team Sports. I am one of your gracious hosts. They call me Loudbeard. You are the most egotistical, self-deluded person I have ever met. Yes, and all of that is true. And the man on the other microphone, the man, the li- the myth, the legend, the Great patriot himself, and that would be America, America, America. yeah, yeah. Well, I know he's out there somewhere. We have been texting this morning, talking about all the great news in the sporting world, and we're just gonna oh. dive right. No, I had it going. Hold on. Hit me again, please. I had it perfect. I had everything lined up, and I forgot to hit that damn microphone button on the studio. I'm over Uh, here jamming out, and then I hear you going, I know he's out there somewhere, and I'm like, no! Oh, I guess it wasn't as perfect as you thought it was. Uh, It never is. America! America! Yes, Loudbeard, that is the one, the only, the Gator fight song as the Florida Gators make the world, make the universe right again. We have finally beaten Florida State. We took a five-year hiatus. We let little brother kind of, you know, run around the house a little bit. But guess what, Florida State fans? Daddy's home. You are, you've been served. I ran out of (laughs) things to say. No, that's okay. I think you, you did just enough to get noticed here where we know what is going on. We know what the the right thing is. So, Gators, they get a big win, right? Florida State can't live up to the billing. Our Florida good State, friend. FSU stands for 5-7 and seven University. 5-7 and seven uni- FSU, yeah, it does. Now it does. Uh, so the bowl streak, 36 years in a row, Florida done. State's bowl streak is now officially done. The Florida Gators... Take it to the end for Florida wait, wait, wait. State. The 36-year winning streak, uh, done. Done. He, what else is done? We, we won't even mention his name, but he was giving me all kinds of crap about how we lost to Kentucky for the first time in 31 years. Done. 36 years. Done. Hmm. Yeah, this is a tough year for Florida State. I mean, I would say that they're, they cannot be too excited about what the future holds. With Willie, you got bringing a new coach. You expect some new excitement. You expect some changes. You expect the team to be better, and they are not better. They are worse. They have gotten to be a lot worse. So I would say it is not looking good out there in Florida State land. But great, great win for your Florida Gators. Yeah, I would say with rivalry week, you get all these great matchups, and you never know what the outcome is going to be. Anything and everything can happen. And in your Florida Florida game, you had to have been nervous going into this mm, one. Only a little bit. But I said from, like, I think week four, whenever your dad was in town, I definitely made that bet. I definitely knew then Florida was going to utterly pulverize. My only my only nervousness was, was Felipe Franks. He always makes me nervous, but he played really well. Had a couple of bad throws, but all in all, he did a good game. He had a solid season. He led our Gators to 9-3, so solid win. And by the way, Loudbeard, I don't know if you know this, but Florida State hasn't put 40 points on Florida in uh, since 1991. I don't feel like doing math this early on a Monday. And they have never put 40 points up on us in Gainesville. So those are two things that we did to the Florida State Seminoles this past Saturday. Score 41. 
All right. Live it, love it, enjoy it while you can because every year it gets tougher and tougher, and we'll see what next year holds. But Florida State, they got to bounce back, right? They got to yeah, get better than what they're doing right now. Well, All right. Beard, we, mm-hmm. we have a short show today. We're at 30 minutes today, so we apologize to our fans. I know we've been gone for four days, and then we come back, but... Uh, unfortunately, we we don't quite have the listenership yet to quit our job, so we both have responsibilities this morning, and we need to do quick fire, rapid fire, two minute drills. Um, Thirty minutes is basically two minutes of NBA basketball. So, you think we got this? Yeah, I think we got this. All right, let's talk about the worst part of the weekend. Uh, was Mackenzie Milton going down? There, there's very few times that my heart sinks. And one of the times is when a when a player gets injured like that on the field and you see it live on TV. And that's what that's what my heart did. It just it just sunk. It just stinks for that kid. Yeah, oh, it absolutely does. And this is a horrific injury. If you did not see it already, if you go back and watch it, I just say be prepared because it is not easy. It's not an easy one to swallow because it is a gross looking injury. And there's been a few other injuries like this with the dislocated kneecap and the leg turning in a really awkward and uncomfortable looking way and a lot of these players aren't able to return aren't able to get back onto the field and this is one of those serious injuries where they have to rush to emergency surgery and I mean there could have been artery damage nerve damage ligament damage all kinds of damage to the leg and in with these injuries, they've been very private about what's going on with Mackenzie Milton. The family has asked for privacy, so there hasn't been a lot of details leaked, but a lot of times when there's artery damage, they have to say, we have to go in and repair this immediately or or the leg could be lost. So this is more than just football. This is for yeah. this kid's well-being that we, we talk about. Um, we hope that he's going to be okay from... What I've heard, the sources that I have, is that he's recovering from a successful surgery, and we're just going to leave it at that, and hopefully this kid is able to come back. Hopefully he's able to recover fully from this injury, but you never know, and only time will tell, and we're going to have to patiently wait to see what the, the outcome and the prognosis is with this injury and how he's able to recover from it. The good news is he's young. Usually the younger you are, the easier you can come back. Zach Miller, who is a tight end for the Chicago Bears, had a very similar injury a couple of years ago. He is he was not able to come back, but he was 34 years old when that happened. And he's recovering, but it's been a long recovery. He's had to have numerous surgeries after the fact. So this is a situation that could be very serious. It could be career-ending for him on the football field. And we just hope that in real life that it is something that he can recover from and it isn't something that affects him in his entire life. But... At this point, it could be something that could very well hamper this young man for his entire life where he has to struggle walking, struggle running. Um, He feels pain his entire life. So this is a very serious injury, and you hate to see that. And though they they are extremely rare, Loudbeard, this is why I've always been on the side of college players being paid. This is why I'm on the side of Le'Veon Bell wanting his, you know, long-term contract because you just never know. You never know. And this was just a, a freak accident had this kid uh i don't know who tackled him but had the south florida kid just you know came in or a little bit sooner a little bit later to the left to the right whatever it was but this was just that freak accident the the helmet hit his leg at just the wrong spot to break it and it it's just it's so sad and and it sounds selfish to say this it sounds bad because i feel like any player that gets injured like this it's bad but you do feel a little bit more like something is lost when it's a kid that's this good and a kid that's that has this promising of a future. I don't know if this kid would have been an NFL quarterback because he is at a very uh, generous 5'11". And we already know that the NFL doesn't like quarterbacks under six feet. They don't, they don't look at him. I mean, that was one of Baker Mayfield's biggest uh, criticisms for him is that he was 5'11". But, you know, we've seen Baker Mayfield go in. We've seen Drew Brees. We've seen Russell Wilson. But kids like that don't get much of a shot. But I think Mackenzie Milton would have had one. And you're right, man. I, I hope for his NFL career he's able to get back in, in, on a strong leg and run again. But also, like you said, for the rest of his life, like, you know, I hope he doesn't have to walk around with a limp, doesn't have to walk around with, you know, chronic leg pain for the rest of his life. We don't know. But our thoughts and prayers are definitely with Mackenzie Milton. Yeah, and I just wanted to say that 
Um, we appreciate all of our listeners reaching out to us on Twitter. We're at Scout Team Radio on Twitter. Right now, Ian Hall, who is a big listener of the show and a, a friend of the show, has been tweeting in at us. And Ian, is he's letting us know that he's read about some of the reports on Mackenzie Milton and, and this dislocated knee. He also said that he knows that Chris Scout Team was really nervous about this Florida game. And all of that is true. Thank you, Ian, for tweeting in at us. I will do. I do want to move on um, from the injury and just talk about UCF again. They're on this Cinderella run. It's been a two-year undefeated streak, two back-to-back -back regular seasons undefeated. They get the big win at USF, and that was their rivalry game. It was at home for USF, and UCF still comes out with a 38 to 10 win with the backup quarterback. And you know what? This is going to be kind of interesting as we get into championship week. And I have some chaos theory that I want to just spit out here on the airwaves. UCF, they have a chance to still make the CFP playoff. Number one, they've got to take care of their business, right, Chris America? They're playing Memphis in the American Championship this weekend. Memphis is coming into town, so it will be UCF versus Memphis. So UCF has to handle that business. And that backup quarterback, he's got to show up. Uh, Mac, he is a tremendous backup quarterback. He can run the ball effectively. He's still got to work on some of those touch passes, but we'll see how he ends up developing with a full week of practice. He's still a very talented young man, and I know that he's going to take the reins and do well with this UCF team. What we also need is Oklahoma to go in and lose to Texas. Very possible. Texas is a very tough team, and they have gotten hot as of late. With Tom Herman out there coaching, you never know what could happen. Okay, cool, hook him. And next we need Ohio State to go in and lose to Northwestern. Well, OSU fans would say, oh, we would never lose to Northwestern, but Ohio State has lost to Purdue, and they, they got run up by Maryland and almost lost that game to Maryland. So I would have to say that Northwestern beating Ohio State isn't as far-fetched as some people may think. And the last theory that I have that has to happen, the last piece is Alabama beating Georgia. And yes, I think that is a gimme. I don't think Georgia is going to hang with Alabama. So I got Alabama beating Georgia. I've got Northwestern beating Ohio State. And I've got Texas beating Oklahoma. And all of a sudden, the number four team in the nation, to me, would have to be UCF. Would have to be. I don't think you can keep them out at that point. Chris America, what do you think of my chaos theory? I I think it's it's a good theory, and I agree with everything you say. Man, it would it would definitely put it would definitely put the college football playoff in a in a very tight corner that they would have a lot of explaining to do to get themselves out. I already feel feel like this season has exposed the CFP more than ever because every single excuse you have for UCF not to get in, they've they've had to explain why it doesn't apply to other teams. And it's just getting more and more to that point. And especially if that scenario plays itself out. Now they're gonna say, Oh well, McKenzie Milton and, and the uh there's several media members that are now turning their thing saying, Oh, I would have put I would have given UCF a chance now, but now that Mackenzie Milton's out, now they don't deserve a chance because, you know, he was their best player and now they're not deserving. And I think it's a load of, of honk. I think it's just a convenient thing. And it's it's actually kind of sick that they're take they're, they're going with that take because they're using a kid's injury to sort of make themselves look good. Um, but, you know, that excuse doesn't fly either because Ohio State was allowed in with their third string quarterback a few years ago and they ran the table and won a national championship. So if Ohio State is allowed in with their third string quarterback, then UCF should be allowed in and you're right, UCF did great with with Mac. He is a little raw with his arm, you mentioned that as well, but very athletic, very strong arm and UCF proved that they can run the ball just as well as they can pass it with over 300 yards rushing. And I'd, I'd like to see it. I, I wish we could have seen it with Milton. I mean, I, I would love to have seen Mackenzie Milton throw against all these other top defenses. And I think he would have done a, a fantastic job. Now it's just Mac's team. And I love that, you know, Mac got behind his quarterback. There's lots of images of him holding up a 10 jersey, him hugging Mackenzie Milton on the stretcher. Just a lot of powerful images. It's why we love sports. It's why 
it's why I fight so hard for UCF because these are kids, these are people who are literally putting their life and now we've seen their limb on the line for 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 their team and I want it to matter. I want it to mean something more than just money for the universities and television numbers and stuff like that. I want these kids like McKenzie Milton and the rest of the UCF team I want NCAA to recognize them and say, yes, you are putting your life and limb on the line for our sport. We are going to reward you for your efforts when you do well on the field. And in Chris America, we, we get another tweet in here on our Twitter machine today. At Mean Green underscore 42, David Green's tweeting in, you know, Ohio State on offensive efficiency is ranked 7th and UCF is ranked 8th. And then when you look at defensive efficiency, UCF is ranked 41st and Ohio State is ranked 42nd. Yeah. Basically right. we, neck and neck. It's the same, same we appreciate that, numbers David there. Green. Yeah, we appreciate we that research, David Green. And we saw that last year with Wisconsin and UCF and the whole strength of schedule argument. Where our strength of schedule was the same as Wisconsin's, and yet Wisconsin was like five or six spots ahead of UCF. I mean, like I said, they've every single excuse they throw out for UCF, then they get caught in a pickle when – the, another team does the exact same thing that UCF is doing or not doing, and they have to explain themselves. But I don't know, man. I feel like more and more as this season has played on, more people have been converted to UCF's uh, fight to get in the playoffs. More people have been converted to not even just UCF's fight, but just a fight to expand the playoffs. We're starting to see how much BS this college football playoff system start is. I mean, I get it. When this thing came out four years ago, I know you were excited. I was excited. Hey, man, we're finally getting something different. We're finally getting a, a step towards playoff, and we thought it was pure. We thought it was good. And then we just realized it was more of a how do we make sure that six teams or eight teams uh, of college football are always ensured to play for a championship year in and year out? And that's what it really has turned into. Yeah, I 100%. Now, this is a great time for them to expand. I mean, this is the the call for it. You've got UCF, who the first Group 5 team that's ever been ranked this high that ever has had this opportunity to even be considered in the playoffs. So your, your Group of 5 is coming in and crashing the party, and that's what everybody hates. They think it's a Power 5 world. Well, then you also have, if Ohio State loses to Northwestern, the Big Ten could be out, and that's a big deal. For a second it, year in a row. And, for two years in a row. And when you have teams like Ohio State and Michigan, and these are the, you know, these are the blue bloods of, of college football, apparently. When well, If they get left out again, yeah. then there is going to be an uprising from the Big Ten. Because what we're saying is, guess what? We're not letting all of these conferences in. We're not we're not making this as fair as this should be. We're and there even... needs to be expansion. And yeah. there needs to be and there could be an outcry of some of the Power 5 conferences saying, "Whoa, whoa, whoa. This isn't the SEC championship. We don't want Georgia and Alabama in here again." Like this is we need these other conferences. We need representation. We need the conference champions to be in this conversation. We need something more than what we have. And if we can get an outcry from enough people, maybe we can get change. And I think UCF has been that catalyst. And if one of these other conferences get, gets left out, which, again, there's no gimme that Ohio State can beat Northwestern. If Northwestern wins and crashes Ohio State's party, there's no way I see Ohio State or Michigan squeaking in the CFP. Now, if UCF is absolutely not going to get in, Loudbeard, even with your chaos theory, I, I kind of want... Alabama to lose to Georgia and they still keep Alabama in exposing the ridiculousness of the college football playoff again. I mean, I always I already thought it was ridiculous. I think they would too. And I think they would as well, especially if it's like a a 3 to 10 point loss, I think Alabama stays in. And it also depends on like if Ohio State loses and if if everything in your chaos theory happens but Georgia beats Alabama, I think UCF doesn't get in. I think they just keep Alabama right where they are. And they move them to number four, and I think that exposes what another another excuse of oh well we can't expand the college football playoff because then it ruins the regular season which is already a playoff. No, it's not. Not for certain teams. For certain teams, it is. If UCF loses, they're eliminated. 
if Alabama loses once, if LSU loses twice, I had LSU fans telling me they still think they had an outside shot. And I'm like, I believe we, I believe you. I agree with you. I think LSU did have an outside shot. But then if they did get into the college football playoff, if LSU did, then you're basically telling me that, number one, the, the regular season doesn't matter. It's just, are you a Power 5 team who... Are you one of those blue blood blue blood brands? Then you're in no matter what happens. And then you're also telling me that twenty nine to nothing means absolutely nothing to to anybody's mind. Like you're sitting here telling me that if UCF gets blown out in the playoff, that settles it forever. UCF will never be invited again. But then you look at at home, LSU at home losing to twenty nine nothing means that they still have a shot to go play Alabama again. Why would anybody want to see that game? Why would anybody want to see LSU? outside of LSU fans in the college football playoff. No, I and there sh- they shouldn't be, but for some reason they were still in that conversation. Now we we got a good question that was posed to us on Twitter. Um what is your opinion on Notre Dame making this? I know they're undefeated, but they have no conference championship. So without a conference championship, do you think that is something that affects their resume? I mean, they they throw a wrench into it because they're an independent in this whole mess. Yeah. And it it just it exacerbates the problem with college football, with the scheduling and everything else. How this is, we talked about how we compared this to boxing. How this isn't a unified front where everybody has a fair schedule or or the similar schedules and similar paths to the championship. Everybody has a different road that they take and they're all individual promoters. And Notre Dame is one of the biggest promoters of them all. And the fact that they just control whatever they do and we give them a bone because they're Notre Dame, because they have 11 or 12, whatever national championships. If Notre Dame didn't have their history, they would not be included in this discussion because I, I'm trying to think of like who the other independents are. But let's say it's Army, right? Let's say Army schedules the same exact schedule as Notre Dame and they have the same exact results. I don't think Army is going to be be allowed in because they're army they're going to have the same treatment that ucf gets and again it's just another thing where i said that the college football playoff wasn't created to to just tell all 132 teams you now have a shot to make the top four and we're going to put the top four teams in it's going it's now of who are the top four brands with the best record that is what the college football playoff is they're going to say who are the here's our eight brands that we love, the Oklahomas, the USC's, the Alabamas, the Notre Dames. I mean, maybe it's more than eight. Maybe it's 10 to 12. And then they say, who's the best four out of them? And then when they get through that list, then they go down of who's the next top power five team uh, on this list, and they go through that as well. And it's just, it's just dumb. I mean, we saw Kentucky. Kentucky beat Florida. They were undefeated through whenever they played Texas a and I want to say it was like middle of October. And they were nowhere near the ranking that LSU had who lost to Florida. Mm. So, I mean, that tells you right there where the mindset is at. So I'm with you, man. Hey, now I have a question for you. What's Jim Harbaugh's deal? Why can't he beat Ohio state? This team is so good. And then all of a sudden, every time they play Ohio state, they, they suck. Uh, Is it, I don't know. You, You know, Jim Harbaugh makes the, is the epitome of that question of, does your record matter if you can't beat your rival? And for Miss America, she's ready for him to be gone. Like, she, she's over him. You know, you can't lose to Ohio State four years in a row. You can't go into this past weekend being what looked like on paper a far more superior team than Ohio State. Michigan, by all accounts, no matter who you listen to, was the better team by, by, by just looking at the two teams. And then he lets them put 62 points on them. I don't even think it was that he lost to Ohio State. It was in the manner of which he did it and, and just you know how they went into the game of one team was ranked number four, the other team barely beat out Maryland. They should have lost to Maryland a week ago, and now you, you struggle on offense against this team that Maryland just moved the ball against all over the field, and then you allow them to score 62 points. Uh, I know. It, it's hard to... It's- as a, if I were a Michigan wins. fan, I would I would be stressed about that. You know, like it's that rivalry game. I think Jim Harbaugh needs to stay because he has had so much success. And the rivalry game is just one game, but eventually he's got to get over this. And it, I think he's going to have maybe one 
two more years, and if he continues to lose to Ohio State, he will be ousted. But he's moving in the right direction. This this team has gotten better and better each year. I, I can't complain as an outsider looking in. I, if I was a Michigan fan, I'd be excited about what he's done, but still disappointed with, with this Ohio State just – yeah, lost train that he's on. So he has 10 wins this season. I believe it's his third out of his four years of having 10 wins. And I think that buys him another shot. But I think next year, even if they go 11-0, and and if they lose 62-38 to again to Ohio State in the big house, I don't know how you don't move on. I, I just don't. It's really hard in college football, nonetheless, to lose to to a rival, especially when your rivalry is as big as the Michigan-Ohio State is. What if they bring in like a backup coach only for that Ohio State game every year? Maybe, maybe they should. Maybe they should resurrect. Uh, is I don't know which one it is. I think Bo is their coach and Woody Hayes is the Ohio State coach. So maybe they bring in Bo. I always get those two mixed up as to who coached who, but I feel like Bo mm-hmm. Schembechler was Michigan's coach. Yeah, uh, sure. Let's go with it. Let's go with it. So um, we only have a... a f- I was going to say we only have a few minutes left. We spent a lot of time on college football. I'm going to just glance over the NFL real quick. Um, Aaron Rodgers with the big loss last night. Yeah. Uh, Got out by Kirk Cousins. Of course. Top five. Top five. What, do you think the Packers have any chance of making the playoffs at this point? They're 4-6-1. and one. Without looking at their schedule, no. Okay, I, I'm with now, you. Now, if, like, if they have like the Dolphins and the Bills and the Jets left on their schedule, then yes, but... I, I'm just blindly guessing. I'm, I'm assuming they have a few more games against other top NFC teams, so no. I'm going to say uh, no also. They're 4-6-1. Aaron Rodgers believes that there is still a path for the Packers to make it through. But if they go unde- uh, undefeated the rest of the way and they end up being 9-6-1, and one, they would have to squeak into a wild card and hope that there weren't any other wild card teams at 10-6, and six, which means your Panthers, my Redskins, would all have to lose at least two games to finish out the season. Um, the Seattle Seahawks, who are charging right now, they would have to go without losing two games the rest of the season. I, I think that he would hope that some of these other teams start falling apart, but there is a good shot that they are completely eliminated. And... I think the Packers are exposed, and McCarthy is going to be done after this season. No, I agree with you, and um, they have to play perfect. They can't play like they did, so they have Cardinals, Falcons, Bears, Jets, and Lions. So it's doable. The Bears is the only team that I feel like they're not better than. You know, the rest of the teams, very, very doable schedule. The Lions are the only other wild cards. Falcons have kind of just been floundering around so it's doable but if they lose one that's it yeah absolutely they will have no shot if they lose one now Lamar Jackson has a huge huge day and the Ravens are back in the conversation of the playoffs uh I would say that Flacco may not see the field again even if he is healthy do you think that John Harbaugh the other Harbaugh to save his job needs to ride Lamar Jackson the rest of the year I think so, especially if Lamar Jackson keeps playing really good. You know, it sucks being a quarterback with a coach that is on the hot seat because he doesn't care about you or your feelings. He's doing whatever it takes to keep him in his in his job. I think Joe Flacco, if Lamar Jackson rides it out the rest of the season, plays really well, Joe Flacco is going to be one of those interesting stories of what are the what are the Ravens going to do with him, what teams are going to take a shot on Joe Flacco rather than maybe getting one out of the NFL draft. Can the Ravens convince, I don't know if he, is he still under contract next year? If he is, can the Ravens convince one of the teams in the top five of the draft to give up that first round pick for him? Would you, would you trade a first round pick for Joe Flacco? Mm, I would not trade a first round pick for Joe Flacco, even though he is elite. Uh, Last bit of NFL stuff I want to cover before we finish our quick early show today was this the greatest weekend in Cleveland history? The Browns go in and blow out the Bengals. That's the Hugh Jackson assistant coach-led Bengals. Ohio State beats Michigan, and the Cavs beat both the Sixers and the Rockets this weekend. Cleveland is on a heater. Was this the greatest weekend in Cleveland history? Yes. All Without right, good a doubt. answer. <laughs> I mean, they might as well just burn the city down now. 
I know. This was almost as good as when that LeBron carried uh, the Cavs to that championship that one time. Almost as good, but not quite because Kyrie Irving carried that team. And now he's in Boston, so it's like a it's like a bad reminder. It is a bad reminder. But Loudbeard, it was a great weekend in Orlando because the UCF Knights beat their rival over in Tampa, and the Orlando Magic sweep the LeBron James led Lakers. I think that's a good as good uh, good as any to hit that outro. Talk about that. Hit the outro, brother. Man, our Magic swept the Lakers. I can't believe it. Ran into it's like that Shaq, buzzsaw. Penny, and Dwight Howard at the peak are all back. Yeah. It was great, man. Take that, LeBron James. No, oh, don't do that we to my LeBron. We showed that guy. <laughs> <laughs>